All right, everybody. Welcome, welcome. Thank you for being here. My name is Rashad Johnson. Today I will be presenting to you, Would You Like to Save Your Game? Uh, preserving the history and culture of video games. To give you an idea ahead of time of what to expect, this will be a general overview on the ongoing issue with video game and media preservation. A lot of these issues overlap surrounding video games, music, movies, and other technologies. By the end of this presentation, my goal is to showcase to you just how prevalent games and other forms of media are in the 21st century, what we can learn from them, how we can use them to improve our own conditions, and perhaps just as a thing to appreciate in both the way that's meant to be fun and the way that it reflects our own culture and values. So, with that being said, just to give you a little bit of background about me and where I'm going to be coming from in this presentation, I am a teacher's apprentice in Baltimore City. Uh, I teach high school English in a special ed facility. I have my bachelor's in game studies from the University of Baltimore, where my research focused on games, media, and culture, and video game history. And my master's in teaching is what I'm currently obtaining in both history and special education, working with grades six through adult. Uh, as far as my research interests, that goes, of course, game studies. But I also research indigenous American history and culture, predominantly in the East Coast United States, as well as black diasporic history with a focus on Afro-Atlantic um, Afro history from the 19th century onwards. So, with that little introduction out the way, I want to ask you guys, why do you think games matter? My goal with this is to be an open dialogue, not just me being up here lecturing why games are amazing. We all know they're amazing. That's why we're here. This is MAGFest, music and gaming. We're here to appreciate it. But I want to hear from you guys just what makes gaming so special to you. Yes, up here. I, I would say it's, it's a reflection of current events. Like when a game is released, it's uh, inspired by what's happening at that time. So mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's a good place in history. OK, that's, yeah, perfect. Uh, yes, you. Mm hmm Yes. Yes. Uh, can you repeat some of these back so that the rest of us can hear what they're saying? Oh, sorry. So, uh, just to recap, we have games are useful in that they teach critical thinking. Um, we have games are useful in that they can tell you a little bit about yourself. They're good for reflection tools. Uh, we have the fact that games teach about current events going on. Um, let me see. Get you over there. They help you escape from reality and like tough things you're going through, just like film and television. Yes, so games are a perfect example of escapism and they're a perfect tool for that. 2020 onwards is a perfect time where we probably want to escape right now, just saying. And I'll take one more. Uh, yes, you, in the yeah. blue. Me? Yes, you. Yeah, so like in, like in two ways, you can like experience like a great, great story, or you can create your own into a game. It depends on like the, it could be any genre. Yeah, like that, that's, that's perfect, yeah. Using uh, games for storytelling, um, I had plenty of my own kids, they created their own little board games where they could teach um, just about anything to their own peers. Uh, I just gave them the instructions to make a board game based off of Candyland, and one of my sixth graders made a whole board game surrounding the theme of death and rebirth, um, where like you had to reach the end of the game's uh, board, and if you get caught by father time, you have to reset all of your progress. And then the kid was how old? He was about like 13, 14, 6th oh. grade. <laughs> M middle school is fun, that's all I'm going to say. <laughs> so, uh, actually, before I do that one, I want to show you 
uh, why this is an issue for me. Um, as you can see, cosplaying as Robin. Fire Emblem is one of my favorite series. I played pretty much all the uh, recent releases, Awakening, Fates, Three Houses. Three Houses is probably my favorite one. Um, however, there is an issue with this pretty big franchise that's really glaring and got more glaring with the release of uh, Shadow Dragon and the Blade of Light, or temporary release, I should say. So, I'm just gonna play a quick video explaining that. Return to the Somnio and find out that the emblems are now disappearing, and they all line up to say their farewells, but more importantly, they line up to advertise their respective Fire Emblem games, which for the most part are now unavailable for legitimate purchase in their complete forms. Byleth tells us to buy Fire Emblem 3 Houses, which is available now on the Nintendo Switch, and also the only one that is available officially in a convenient, permanent, and complete form. Corin tells us to buy Fire Emblem Fates, but you cannot pay $20 to play the Revolution Round anymore because the Nintendo 3DS eShop has completely shut down as of March 27th, 2023. Lucina tells us to buy Fire Emblem Awakening, for which the DLC is also completely unavailable for the same reasons. Makaya tells us to buy Radiant Dawn, Copies of which sell for upwards of $200 on eBay, and Ike tells us to buy Path of Radiance, which can sell for $300 or more. Erica tells us to buy Sacred Stones, and Len tells us to buy Blazing Blade, the upcoming official axes of which can only be obtained through the Nintendo Online Subscription Plus Expansion Pack, which is a temporary subscription service for $50 per year, meaning that you will not own the games and you will lose access to them when the service expires. Roy tells us to buy Binding Blade, which still has no official English translation and requires you to have a Japanese Nintendo account to play it on the aforementioned Nintendo Online Subscription Plus Expansion Pack. Leaf tells us to buy Fire Emblem 3776, <laughs> for which we will need to time travel back to 1999 to visit a lost in Japanese convenience store chain to download it onto a Nintendo Power Flash cartridge. Sigurd tells us to buy Fire Emblem Genealogy of the Holy War, which will hopefully be an upcoming remake that you can actually purchase like a normal human being. Celica tells us to buy Fire Emblem Echoes Shadows of Valentia for the 3DS for which a DLC is now also unavailable because of the eShop shutdown. And finally, Marth shows up, telling us to buy Fire Emblem Shadow Dragon and the Blade of Light, which used to be available on the Nintendo Switch Online Store but was then taken off in March 2021 to induce FOMO and cause artificial scarcity, and the others are untranslated or only available from third parties. After hearing all 12 sales So, yeah, that's fun. <laughs> One of the biggest franchises in Nintendo's pocket has, what, 18 main entries so far and a couple side games, and a very small handful of them are even available for purchase at a reasonable price. Let me put that little asterisk right there. Um, if you have $200 plus, you can always get the old ones. But we'll talk about why we're not doing that. And quite frankly, I don't blame anyone who gets it the correct way. So, games have always been important to human history. In the 13th century, King Alfonso X of Castilla created a collection of texts known as the Libro de los Juegos, or the Book of Games. The book is important because it showcases images, poems, and prose on philosophical aspects of life in the time of medieval Spain, at a time where the Moors and the native Spaniards were interacting with one another. And what better way to interact with one another than sharing a table playing chess? Economists today, like Dr. Matthew McCaffrey, use MMOs, or massively multiplayer role-playing games, like World of Warcraft, to discuss and analyze key market factors like supply and demand, and hyperinflation. <laughs> Perfect showcase of why this is terrifying. <laughs> uh, yeah, so if you're an econ student and you're wanting to get an easier way of understanding market factors, uh, maybe just play a little bit of WoW, I'm just saying. It's a little bit easier than reading 400 pages of a dense textbook that you're not going to use after the semester. Games are also great in that they allow um, marginalized groups of people to showcase their own stories in their own way. 
Games like Never Alone have been used as a means of preserving the fleeting indigenous cultures. In this, in this case, the Inupiaq people in Alaska. These games have been made in collaboration with and as well as outside the authorization of indigenous peoples. The key here is allowing the indigenous peoples to speak for themselves rather than speaking over them. Games, in this case, are great in showcasing a often forgotten people that are still here. Speaking of people that are still here, the COVID-19 pandemic has been interesting, to say the least. Many lives were lost unnecessarily during the pandemic, and one of those lives was Fern Leroy, a Canadian who, during the early onset of the pandemic, lost his life to the illness. Final Fantasy XIV was one of the biggest games during the COVID pandemic. And what better way to honor one of your fallen friends than having a funeral in their honor, whether you knew them or not. This was a showcase of great empathy as many of these people didn't even know Leroy and their families was very grateful for that showcase of empathy. Games also are just, as a commodity, extremely profitable. It goes without saying that this is a multi-billion dollar industry. An article from GameIndustry.biz back in 2023 showcased that the game industry was worth about $183 billion. This is worth twice as much as the global box office, which was valued at about $26 billion as of 2020, uh, 2022. Games are also um, not made by one person, shocker. They're made with a team. Yet this is often forgotten within the larger game industry, which has led to many people unionizing and fighting for their rights. The, ga the gains in revenue would not have been possible without the labor exploitation. At this point, in a 2022 survey from UniGlobal, union support has been pretty um, loudly spoken, with about 80% of the game industry workers demanding that the industry unionizes and gives actual um, rights and fair pay to these people who are making a multi-billion dollar industry on their backs. So, it is important, as we see, that we protect this history, but that isn't necessarily being done outright. The game industry, despite its importance in boons, is still ill-fated to solidify its past victories, with game consoles and memorabilia succumbing to time, neglect, legalese, or all the above. They are a cultural icon that we should cherish and protect, one that deserves to be lauded, no different from Journey to the West or the Mona Lisa or the Leaning Tower of Pisa. They are an icon of human ingenuity intelligence and caring. And it's with that in mind that by working to preserve these games, we're preserving windows into our culture, windows into ourselves, ways of seeing that are often marginalized and not looked at properly. So, to solidify this history, three things have to be constructed, not just by us, but also by developers and scholars. We need AAA studios like Nintendo and Sony, who we'll talk more about later. Um, they have to become more willing to embrace and provide for emulation technology instead of forcefully abusing or hastily utilizing copyright law that is often one-sided. Developers are also going to have to be compelled to recruit and work effectively with historians, archivists, librarians, and museum curators in order to establish a facility or a group of facilities that actually honor and showcase the history that is worth, again, billions of dollars. And even outside of just money, it's just the right thing to do. The last thing to talk about is the fact that game studies, as a field in and of itself, while relatively new, is still important. And scholars should work to establish interdisciplinary game studies departments outside of universities that already have a game design department. So. 
We're going to look in depth at some of these issues and the current state of gaming preservation. There are several issues regarding the feasibility of preserving games. For starters, planned obsolescence. How many of you guys have washed your clothes one day and you started seeing a bunch of little holes inside of your shirts, your pants, yada? Yay. <laughs> you can thank planned obsolescence for that, and we'll talk more about it. Planned obsolescence like that in Sony's older consoles, which are breaking down by the seams, on purpose, intentionally produce flawed and imperfect consoles, living on borrowed time. There's also the fact that there are performance issues on today's hardware. Anybody ever has an old CRT TV? Got a few of them, got a few, perfect. Keep them, please, for the love of Christ, keep them. These TVs are better than the ones that we have today in that they don't really have lag. These are perfect for competitors who want to play um, Guilty Gear or Smash or Street Fighter and don't want to have to constantly guess and sh um, is this input going in? Are we, are we at the perfect time to use this move yet? No. Great. And I just lost $20,000. <laughs> then there's legalese. There's a bunch of copyright law, a bunch of um, state rulings that kind of get in the way of preserving video games and games as a whole. Licensing, DMCA takedowns, um, and archival and museum efforts, they're constantly harmed by outdated laws. And last is just the fact that this is a race against time. Consoles are dying left and right. The Center for Computing History leader Jason Fitzpatrick has been outwardly supporting the highly controversial tech that is emulation. We'll get more into that later. And lastly, it's just the fact that, again, game studies is a new field. We're going to have to start nurturing it. Um, or more accurately, it's less of a new field, more that's still young. We'll talk more about that as we go. So I wanted to highlight a key study that came out as of last year from the Video Game History Foundation. They found that in a sample of 1,500 games, about 87% of those video games are gone for good. 87%. And a lot of these games that are gone for good are locked between the mid 80s to early 90s. This is even more bleak as if you're someone who likes arcade games or they enjoy games from that particular era, there's only one way that you can get those effectively now. <laughs> Yep. <laughs> so, why don't we just fix this? This is a pretty big issue. we kind of known about this for quite some time. Well, we are trying to fix it. Scholars, museum experts, archivists, they are trying their damnedest. But trying, trying just won't get you too far sometimes. Companies like Nintendo and Sony are actively hostile towards any fan projects, preservation efforts, all that stuff. Gaming organizations like the Entertainment Software Association, they have been historically ousted in 2015 for conflating video game preservation to the protection of piracy and hacking. And of course, there's also the case of remastering and remaking your games. These are great, I love RE4 Remake, but the fact remains well, we kind of need to keep the old stuff to appreciate the new. And sometimes games like Shimigami Tensei, Nocturne HD kind of make the old one look eh, bad in retrospect because it was also bad. So I wanted to get a little bit more in depth about that study I cited earlier. Like I said before, about 87% of old school games are lost for good. About most of those are coming from the late, seven, late 70s to about early to mid 90s, as you see on the graph here. Less than 10% are even, are even um, still around between the 70s and the 80s. And it doesn't really get that much better. We want to keep the games that we have for as long as possible, and we're gonna need to work our we're going to have to do our best to preserve what we have because 
it doesn't really get that much better than this. How bad is it? Well, for comparison, this is only slightly above the availability of pre-World War II audio recordings. Like I said, there's a strong link here between music, films, and video game preservation. About 10% or less of pre-World War II audio recordings are still available to people to research or view as they please. And this is slightly below the survival rate of American silent films, which is at 14%. The main, the main goal of the study was to look at Game Boy games, and Game Boy games really aren't doing so hot. As of April 20, 2023, only 5.87% of those games are still around. Everything, everything from Fire Emblem Blazing Blade to Fire Emblem Binding Blade, Golden Sun, all those games are slowly fading. Final Fantasy VI Advance, fading. Uh, old school Pokemon games. Well, they're only around because we keep putting them on online services or re-releasing them, but those are only temporary. We'll talk more about that later, but those are not the full solutions that we need to keep them around. This, speaking of which, really doesn't get much better considering the fact that these online storefronts are going to close eventually. I think everybody got really scared when the Wii U and 3DS eShops were being taken down and there was really no plan to back up those games. Fire Emblem Awakening, gone. Project Cross Zone 1 and 2, gone. Samurai Warriors Chronicles, gone. Uh, Codename Steam, gone. I really liked that game, that was fun. This doesn't get better on Sony's end either. The PS3 and the PS Vita and uh, the PSP stores were going to be gone, but enough fan outcry was able to save two out of three of them. It's still a pain in the ass to get those two games, um, those two storefronts, because you have to load the money on from your computer, uh, and then you get the money on your, um, on your storefront. You can't just go directly on the storefront to load your money on there. You have to go through a whole rigmarole of doing that. So anything to nickel and dime us. Pretty much. Pretty much. And the worst part about it is you're not really paying for the game, you're paying for a temporary license to say that you have the game. Now, going from software, we got to talk about the hardware and preserving the hardware that we have. When, project, when products are intentionally designed to fail, after just a small artificial predetermined time, that's what planned obsolescence is. It's done when powerful companies start monopolizing a market and they want to demand brand loyalty out of you. This first started in the United States in the early 20th century when groups like the Phoebus Cartel and General Motors intentionally made electronics, light bulbs and such obsolete on purpose. They went from lasting over a century to only lasting a few decades. And we see this in cars, food quality, technology quality. Things went from lasting for years upon years to lasting for about six months and you gotta go back and start buying your clothes again. They spawned because market saturation and because com customers only bought items long term instead of getting them in short term bursts, which wasn't really profitable for companies. So, to milk as much money as possible, you're gonna have to start making things as cheaply as possible, as quickly as possible. Older Sony consoles like the PlayStation 3 and 4, they were found to have a design flaw, where in all games, physical or digital, they would be unplayable thanks to the clock battery inside of it dying. The Twitter user Force found that when the CMOS battery was removed, gameplay, whether it's physical or digital, completely halted. This was later fixed, but the fact that it was there at all is the problem at hand. If I pay $60, and now $70, Jesus Christ, for the games that I'm hoping to own long term, I should play that whenever I want, however I want. But that's not the case. We also see this in other technology, most notably phones, specifically iPhones. Apple has been cited multiple times by the FTC for their use of planned obsolescence. 
um, France right now is currently opening an investigation on them because in France, they do not play this kindly. Either your devices work or they don't. There is no in-between. So, planned obsolescence. This is a huge problem. It restricts our right to repair. We'll talk more about that as one of our solutions, but the right to repair essentially allows you to repair your devices with the necessary tech and the knowledge freely distributed to you guys. It adds more unnecessary electronic waste into our environment as well. So this isn't just the thing of, I want to keep my game. This is also a thing of, I want to keep my planet that I'm living on. It constantly reinforces hyper-consumerism, which is when we're constantly going to the market, buying food, buying clothing that we don't need. We're buying everything in bulk, and we really only need it for a couple of days. The resources that we're constantly consuming, they're going to create harsher labor conditions for marginalized groups. So this is a no-win situation for everyone. And unfortunately, there's just no legal protections for consumers at the moment. Now that we talked about plans obsolescence, I want to get into the legal side of this as well. So, games like Sunset Overdrive, Diddy Kong Racing, Marvel vs. Capcom 2, um, they exist in a purgatory, essentially, due to licensing and ownership issues. These games can ultimately come back whenever the licensors decide it to, and chances are it's not going to be anytime soon. We're still waiting. It can either affect the entire game itself or part of the makeup. For example, a game might have licensed music in it and the um, music artist decides, I want to pull my music. There's nothing that you can do as um, the developer except acquiesce to the request. You might also have references to celebrities. They want their likenesses taken down. You also got to give that up. Once these licenses expire, oftentimes it's just too costly to renew them, so they fade into obscurity. Similarly, borrowers are also not inclined to go ahead and renew these things. Licensed games like Marvel's Avengers from 2020, they're seen as just the cash grab in the grand scheme of things. They're a tie-in. When their time is over, their time is over. You paid $70 for a glorified reference prop. You might like the game, but in reality, if we're looking at this as a commodity, strictly business, that is the fate of these games. So, we have a lot of licensed games like this. We got X-Men, Simpsons, Marvel vs. Capcom 2. All these games will fade to time because along with being licensing nightmares, arcade games have reached their zenith. There's a small group of people that want to keep these games alive, and that's usually the selling point that businesses have. It's just a small group of people, so why care? At that point, the games are just destined to die for good. Unless, well, we can bring them back, hopefully. Or, yark. <laughs> so, two options exist. Either we're going to have to renegotiate those licenses and extend them, or they just fade to time. Digital stores like GOG or companies like Night Drive Studios, they constantly have to deal with these licensing issues. Their chances are they're not going to want to deal with them for too long. And when the uh, license exper um, period expires, that's it. Whatever the game's state is in, that's it. You're going to have to find the game in that state, if you can find it at all. Now that that game is extremely rare, people are going to pay an arm, a leg, and their mortgage just to get that game. <laughs> Whenever it's reselling, um, the game will just maybe come back. It'll start to um, be patched, maybe. Um, or maybe it'll get remade or remastered. We just don't know. In the grand scheme of things, this is no one's fault but the game industries, larger studios. Due to their lack of forethought, commodification of all the art that they have, and the unwillingness to preserve these games. No one really thought to preserve these lifetime achievements until very recently. None save maybe Nintendo, who've done a better job at it than most. But that praise is kind of put on deaf ears, as we've seen time and again from Nintendo constantly taking people's progress down on preserving these games. Now that we got that out the way, we're also going to have to talk about, well, what are emulators? We're going to have to talk about that elephant in the room some way. 
So, before we get to that, I want to talk about copyright. Copyright is the intellectual property that protects legal uh, original works of authorship as soon as an author fixes that work in a tangible form of expression. That just, me that just means whenever, um, that just means that whenever a creation is made, be it a movie, a film, a TV show, a game, um, those things are protected by those companies in any way that they see fit. Any creator can be a copyright holder, whether it's the company or an individual. As of January 1st, 1978, copyright lasts for the life of the owner plus 70 years. Meaning for that duration, the creator or their descendants can decide how best we want to proceed with this license. It's extended by companies and authors in a bid to give royalties posthumously to those who have not created or even a little bit of that property and is just glorified revenue for future pursuits. These laws are overseen not by Congress, but by the Librarian of Congress. The Librarian of Congress is the sole arbitrator for all of these laws. With copyright, there's also the DMCA, or the Digital Millennium Copyright Act, which was passed by Congress in 1988. This law amended US copyright law to address important parts of the relationship between copyright and the internet in three key ways. First, it protects online service providers from users engaged in copyright infringement. So if you start doing that um, copyright infringing stuff on, well, say, a YouTube video, YouTube is not legally um, held liable for that stuff. It encourages copyright owners to start um, giving greater access to their works in digital formats. So saving digital copies of your films, your games, your movies, all that good stuff by providing legal protections against unauthorized access to their works. And lastly, it illegalizes false copyright management, removal, or alteration, except in a few key ways that are beneficial for museum curators, librarians, archivists. This is what allows them to preserve all the good stuff. A key feature of the DMCA is section 1201, 1201A. It's most important here. A stipulates that no person shall circumvent a technological measure that effectively controls access to a work protected under this title. Don't void the warranty, don't go in there changing a bunch of stuff. Just don't do it. Then D allows for exemptions specifically for librarians, the archivists, the educators, for the sake of educating us about what that property was or is, depending on if it's still around or not. This is key in that it allows those people to effectively showcase what these games are all about. So if you have like an old MMO um, and you wanted to preserve those things, well, hopefully, in theory, these exemptions allow you to do that as a researcher. But there are some efforts by organizations that kind of stymie that effect. Subparagraph D specifically is what allows researchers like us to study and utilize the copyrighted materials. This, mm, this stipulation is very important to us in that it allows for all the knowledge that we have from these games to be disseminated to the general public. Only if these things are protected and of course boosted because as we'll see, these protections aren't enough. With that protection also comes fair use. Fair use is essentially a legal doctrine. It allows people to take copyrighted materials and critique them without any stipulations whatsoever. That being said, it's kind of all over the place when it comes to whether or not it's going to be honored. Again, it is a doctrine. Whether or not it's going to be honored is really just based off of precedence. So it's kind of held in legal limbo. If an artist wants to decide to sue you for showcasing their work on a YouTube video or whatnot, even if it's something protected by fair use, depending on how it's argued, it might not necessarily be. Fair use in this case is protected by Section 107 of the Copyright Act. It allows for criticism and commentary, news reporting and journalism, and academic um, purposes, 
which would just be teaching about a specific thing, utilizing that specific material. This is important because this kind of crosses through with emulation, which essentially allows us to play the old games that we want to play if we don't have the specific hardware. And it comes in three different flavors. Anyone have an old retro console lying around, like a PS2 or a Wii? I mean, by the definition of that study, kinda. We got a 2600. <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah. If you use those old consoles, you could use a PS2, for example, to play PS1 games. That's an example of hard emulation. Basically, the old parts are still in there. So, you have a two-for-one console. Anyone have a couple emulators on their PCs? Or their phones, or their tablets, whatever. Yeah, perfect. That's an example of soft emulation. So, PCSX2 or v, um, VBA, those are soft emulators. Essentially, those are programs that have to act like a console. And then there's kind of the hybrid mix of two. Like, for example, anyone have a 3DS still? Yes, please keep that. Those things are worth like 200 to 400 dollars. Please keep those things. <laughs> um, yeah, so they have, hard, they have hard emulation. You can play old school DS games on those, or you can play virtual console games, which would be soft emulation. They're not really like, is one better than the other? Um, sometimes one just is. For example, soft emulation, it's cheaper and easier to implement. I don't expect Sony to constantly put in the old system within the new system because that's costly and eh, just as long as I can play it, that's all that really matters. And that's kind of the mindset that they have, which is why soft emulation is often chosen. So things like Virtual Console, got to put that in there. Hard emulation, though, is way more reliable in that it pretty much will run your game almost without fail because at the end of the day, it's just that old console. That being said, again, it's really costly. And then there's the hybrid option. So like the lesser two evils, but it's also jack of all trades, better at none. So those are just the things that you have to consider when you're making a console. And lastly, there's some issue with people understanding whether or not emulation is legal or not, because it's often tied to ROM sites, which are illegal. Emulation is legal, and it's vital for understanding the games that we still have remaining. And there are three key laws to remember as such. There's Sega v. Accolade, which was ruled over in California in 1992. There's Sony v. Kinetics, which was from 2000. And there's Sony v. Bleem, which was in, also in 2000. All three of these is what allows emulation technology to be legal, and they are legal because they're enshrined based off of fair use doctrine in 107 of the Copyright Act. Current copyright law, however, is still insufficient in protecting emulators in that, again, as long as that link to ROM sites is still present, companies can constantly use that plaus plausible deniability of these things being true to essentially take down emulation sites left and right, whether or not they're tied to illegal ROM sites. Companies like Nintendo and Sony are notorious for going after players who utilize emulation. For example, there was the Dolphin emulator that was supposed to be uploaded to the Steam store, um, what was it, the year before, I want to say? But that never happened, largely because Nintendo struck it down. Steam also kind of helped in that striking down. So, since the piracy is kind of already out in the open, let's just address it. Let's just address it. There are three things that we have to look at whether or not ROM sites are just. If we want to take the moral stance, don't piss and moan when people start downloading your old games when you decide that you don't want to offer it to people anymore. If I want to play Pokemon Conquest, I'm going to play Pokemon Conquest one way or another. Either give us the thing that you want us to buy or don't mention it. Don't do that thing that you did with the Super Mario um, trilogy on the Switch and just like, hey, we have it. We're going to do a Walt Disney Vault style and just not let you play it. Don't cry wolf when you chose to get bit. 
Then there's the legality of the situation. They're illegal. Next. <laughs> it's the law. We're not really questioning if it's like true in the sense of, is there a gradient to this? It's the law. It either is or it isn't, and they're not. Then there's the middle of the two, ethics. If they're so bad, how do we balance corporate ambitions with the protections of these games? How do we allow companies to make these decisions on their own, despite games only being so prolific because of everyone in this room, the developers that made them, and the businessmen who marketed them? This is a group effort. This is the time where we can actually set the whole statement of there's no I in the team. Then there's the issue of modding and preservation. Some MMOs, like Shin Megami Tensei Imagine, they only exist because of private servers, kept up and made by fans. That being said, companies like Fatless, mm, Atlas, my bad, Freudian slip, um, they treat these things as piracy, and they tell you to take them down. So now you can't play Imagine anymore. And pretty much most MMOs, for that matter, once the MMO is done, it's done. Modern PC ports of Final Fantasy XV on, um, only exist in a good state because of fan projects, because Square Enix likes to just roll crap out without actually checking if it works or not. Companies like Rockstar will slap a DMCA takedown um, in order to market their trilogy, which did not do well at all whatsoever. Maybe if it actually worked, we would actually give them money, just saying instead of just having fans constantly make it do better. Maybe instead of taking down their projects and hurting them, you should actually hire them. That is a thought, and companies have done it. Sonic Mania. Hiring fans might just be what they need, because they got a good two-for-one. They know what we want, and they also know how to do it. Just a thought. Some fans take it upon themselves to create more accurate retellings of the games. For example, Pokemon Brilliant Diamond and Shining Pearl didn't really do so hot when it came to fan reception, leading many to create their own concepts for the games that they wanted to see. Pokemon Diamond, Pearl, and Platinum are classics, and it's right for fans to demand that they are treated as such. Whether it's because they still remember shitting their pants when Cynthia came about, or because they saw the horror show that was Giratina and had that jump scare. I want to protect that no matter what. So, then there's just the fact that regardless of the legalese, regardless of planned obsolescence, regardless of anything, this is a race against time itself. Many older titles are lost due to poor management of source codes and just fading tech. Games like Kingdom Hearts 1.5 and 2.5 HD are not remasters, they're full-on remakes because the original source code for those games are dead. No one can find them anymore at Square Enix because no one thought to protect them. Same thing with Final Fantasy VIII. Gotta make them from the ground up now. Great, perfect. Now we gotta actually protect um, 1.5 and 2.5 along with the original when we can find them. Now all we have are marketed copies of the game rather than the original source code. Some games, MMOs especially, they've been lost due to limited server maintenance. Um, librarians and museums will do their best to keep them around, but at the end of the day, there's just not enough protections for them. And some games just have multiple versions of the game to protect. What if you only have like a certain amount of resources to protect Final Fantasy VI. Well, do I protect the original one that was released in Japan, or do I protect the original one that was released in America, Final Fantasy III? Maybe I want to protect the more updated copy that's more accurate, so I get Final Fantasy VI Advance for the Game Boy. However, that was for the Game Boy, and it's not going to give me the same experience as the original console. It's a lot of things to consider, not just the fact that companies are greedy, which they are, but that's not the, also the, that's not the main, or the only issue, I should say. <laughs> this is especially true when we look at what happens between the link with games and politics. In 2022, the Mariupol Computer Museum in Ukraine was bombed and destroyed. Over 500 exhibits of the Ukrainian history of science and technology and gaming are dead now. All the hopes and dreams that people poured into those games are dead now. Many Western companies decided to show their support 
especially in the Game Awards, by highlighting the need to protect both those people and their dreams within their niche. Unfortunately, that same fervor is missing in the conflict in Palestine, which is a small but still important area when it comes to gaming. A lot of that is made from the underground. And when people are constantly being bombed and harassed and kicked out of their homes, there really won't be much history to talk about. This is why it's such a big issue that during the Game Awards um, back in December, nobody talked about it when they clearly should have. The only place I could think of in gaming that actually talked about the ethnic cleansing going on in Palestine was people make games. Go watch their video if you have it, it's really good. There's also the fact that marginalized people are often not discussed in gaming when they clearly should be until the time of their demise. People like Jerry Lawson, for example, come to mind. Jerry Lawson is important because he's one of the few prolific black engineers that we had from the 1970s that we can point to and say, this is it. This is a man who we can strive to be like, especially if you're somebody that grows up impoverished, black, or just not without that many role models to look at for success. Not every school has um, STEM and not every school has the resources needed to give their kids that no matter how much they want to. So when we see people like Jerry Lawson, we look at hope. But when we don't have the necessary books and everything to look at people like him, we don't have it anymore. The same is true for people like Anna Graves. Women are often marginalized in the gaming industry. Twitter user Clifton Druid just recently found out that she was the one that did the role for Naoto Shiragane originally. This game, which is one of the best Persona games to date, had one of the best characters' um, voices sidelined for over a decade. Now that we know who she is, that's great. But we shouldn't have had to do a one-man search for years on Twitter to find that out. Atlas should have released that in the first place. There's also the fact that hardware is dying left and right. If you look on the top left, you see a Sega Saturn board that's old and bug infested and breaking down with age. Mm, kind of sounds like a person. Kind of sounds really old. <laughs> Uh, this is kind of the fate for all retro consoles at this point. We don't have that many parts left to repair them, and we can't really import those parts either because, well, they're dying everywhere. That's why when people like Logan Paul decided to be frivolous with the remaining parts that we have for the Game Boy Color by creating a resin table out of very much needed parts worth tens of thousands of dollars, people were pissed. And that little internet fame that he got put a lot of people who actually enjoy the hobby and the craft in a very pissed off mood, rightfully so. So, clearly this is a huge problem that we need to talk about and there are many facets to this problem. Not one solution is needed, but many, and we need many lenses from that. Thankfully, there are some solutions. While not new, gaming museums and collections are more recent ideas that combine a mixture of traditional museums of science and technology with the fact that these are games, we need to play them. That's how we experience the history and culture. Places like this include the Straw Museum up in Rochester, New York, and the National Video Game Museum up in Sheffield in the United Kingdom. I had a chance to visit both of these and they have two very different environments but nonetheless have people that are passionate about preserving the history of gaming. And we'll talk more about just like what is the right style to present this history. Exhibition styles, they just vary based on location and ideas and ways of seeing. Some are akin to traditional museums and some are like arcades, but with fancy glass cases that we can look at cool things from. So, how do we choose to remember the past? Every institution is different. The Straw Museum is more like a traditional museum, but with games. They have a little bit of the middle of the road. There are some exhibits that you can play, and there are some that are like trapped behind, well, this, it's a delicate game, so. There's also the fact that other ones like the National Video Game Museum are kind of more focused on keeping the culture alive rather than preserving the little bits that we have from the past. 
After all, history is not just about reflecting on the past, but looking forward into the future. Sitting down playing brawl with a couple of people around the local area was one of my favorite experiences of being in London for the first time. It gave me a chance to see just how people across the pond look at games and gaming culture and what we can do on this side of the pond to preserve that history. There are some libraries and archives too, like Enoch Pratt and Library of Congress, each of them having a different way of showcasing the history and culture. Library of Congress is more of just preserving for the sake of preserving, while Enoch Pratt is more like we want kids to be involved in the history of gaming. So we have tournaments, we have showcasing of what games were at the time, we have a little bit of everything. It's a living classroom, as it were. How we choose to showcase the past and remember the future will be pivotal in how we advance this knowledge. And the best way to secure the places of learning is not to just create facilities, but also to tell a story. We need to remember the past, but finding the best way is gonna take some time and a lot of effort and a lot of different eyes on the situation. There's also the fact that we kind of need to promote this. We don't need to just say that it's important. We need to show that it is important. Games are at the heart of community formation. Spaces like libraries, conventions, and museums, they keep that history alive. And no two facilities will be the same. There's a difference between here and Otakon, for example. Both are pivotal in protecting pop culture, both from the East and the West, but they have two different flavors of doing it. And that's fine, that's perfect, even. There's also places like barcades, which are a perfect mix of preserving old school arcade games and getting a good drink with your mates. That's a perfect place to go and play Simpsons while getting shit-faced drunk left. <laughs> I would say if you're from the Baltimore area or you want to visit Baltimore, go down to Game on Bar and Arcade. It's in Federal Hill. You should try it. Groups like the Video Game History Foundation are important to this space because they showcase an active history worth protecting and they do their best to preserve what matters. The National Video Game Museum is also important as well as other museums specifically focused on gaming but also museums that just want to showcase a little bit of what gaming has to offer. I went to the Smithsonian um, Art Museum uh, a few weeks ago and they were showcasing Never Alone um, which is perfectly fine. This is great, even. I want more stuff like that inside of a traditional museum to showcase the intersectionality of traditional art and gaming art. This is perfect. We kind of need a lot of that stuff. Conventions like MacFest, they serve an important role in preserving this culture. We have people on stage presenting important history uh, facts, ways of seeing, and ways that people can all get involved. And then there are also libraries, both for the public and for academic purposes. If anyone has ever been inside of a game lab, inside of a university, you kind of see how important it is to that university that we explore this topic. Um, for example, at University of Baltimore, we have a game lab that we can showcase all the games that the students are making for the future with the past in mind. Um, the librarian there showcased a lot of how they started, which was just get as many games as we can and lock these things up in the back room and just hope and pray that these games are perfect because we don't really have any other way to do it. Larger facilities like Library of Congress, on the other hand, they have a lot more resources at their disposal so they can meticulous, meticulously catalog how best to preserve these games. Both are both are acceptable ways of preserving the games, and that the fact of the matter is when you don't have that much, you just have to do what you got. There's also the fact that we have to also look at the hardware. We, also, we have to look at ways of improving hardware maintenance. In the US, we're gonna have to campaign for the right to repair legislation. This legislation was formed in direct opposition to companies like Apple, Nintendo, and Sony. They're important because it allows anyone, regardless of your background, to repair as you see fit or modify as you see fit. Sometimes you might have a Joy-Con and that thing is drifting really hard. 
if I send it to Nintendo, it'll just get fixed temporarily. But if I send it to myself or someone I know, the right to repair, however, is not new. The DMCA already allows people to theoretically jump through these hoops of jailbreaking your stuff, but it's pretty difficult, and the knowledge isn't necessarily available. There's also the Magnuson Moss warranty of 95, of, not 95, 75. They allow the FTC to regulate how we showcase warranties to consumers. And then there's, of course, the fact that if you ever have a broken down car, you might have seen this person called a mechanic. That was not always the case. You had to send it to the factory to get fixed, but mechanics are allowed to do that thanks to the Clean Air Act in the 90s. That act forced car companies to include the necessary knowledge for mechanics to fix cars that are now getting more and more computerized. So it's not just a car, it's a glorified computer with wheels. One of the biggest associations for the right to repair is the Repair Association, clever names, Jesus. Uh, <laughs> they're an advocacy group that demand the right to repair for everyone. The government has a duty to ensure that all of these devices are unlockable, adaptable, and modifiable on a consumer need. And all the parts should be available to everyone, regardless of where you're coming from, both as a person and for your occupation. So this isn't just a thing for mechanics, this is for a thing for everybody. And this is pretty important for a lot of reasons. California recently became one of only six states that have right to repair laws. That being said, the law still falls short at protecting video game preservation. Still better than nothing, don't get me wrong, but we kind of need to do a lot better if we're going to actually preserve everything that we need to. That being said, we can't just institute the right to repair at everything willy-nilly. A study from the Harvard Business Review had highlighted how right to repair laws potentially could encourage long-term positive trends, accidentally, mind you, including increased environmental sustainability, increased ethical consumerism, and takedown of monopolies. This is great. This is exactly what we need. But... There's also the fact that companies will just find another way to nickel and dime us one way or another. We need to institute this very smartly if we want to succeed. So, this needs a holistic approach between consumer, um, consumer needs and corporate greed. The right to repair would allow everyone on all fronts to repair what they need to. This is just morally and ethically correct. We need this. Then there's also the fact that, honestly, yeah, let's not even beat around the bush. Keep piracy. We, we need this. We need emulators. Consoles are dying left and right. It's kind of hard for me to justify. Just protect all of the consoles that we have when they're dying left and right. Emulators will actually be perfect for preserving games in that if a computer dies, we can just put an emulator to use somewhere else. And that game will be perfect. The ROM will be perfect. The ISO will still work. Private fan servers are also going to be necessary if we want to preserve old school titles that are MMOs or long term games that unfortunately kind of die as the servers die. They're also essential when it comes to games that have yet to have seen an international release. Games like Binding Blade, for example, still waiting on that. Or Genealogy of the Holy War, still waiting for that. I mentioned Pokemon Conquest earlier still want to play that. Unfortunately, the only way I can do that is if I have the old copy of the game, which I don't, or gotta fire up that emulator. This game will never see another re-release because it was a licensed title between Nobunaga's ambition creator, Koei Tecmo, and Pokemon Company, and Nintendo. All of this is at the heart of game studies, which is a pretty recent but still necessary field. It has went decades of change from the 1970s to 2000s um, moral panics that existed all the way to now where we have, do games help us with fitness? Do games help us with cognitive understanding? Do they teach us ways of seeing ourselves and others? They teach best practices um, in how do we regulate our lives and learning. And they only got this far because of established methodologies 
best audience practices, and best research practices. We're gonna to continue to get better as we go on and on with this. But for now, we should be happy with the progress we have and move forward as we continue to make this field better. It's integral to 21st century study that we study media and games. We have game-based learning, we have games in physical and psychological therapy. The only way we can advance with this stuff is, well, study it more, get more people involved, not just game study scholars, but historians, archivists, psychology majors, economists, everyone needs to get involved with this stuff. We don't need to gatekeep the knowledge when it's a small community. As long as everyone is looking at this, we can find new ways of producing the things that we need to preserve and protect. We also have people combining this stuff. We have Alan Turner, who is both a storyteller and historian, while also being a game developer. We have people like Norman Caruso, who is both a historian outright, as well combining the knowledge and things needed in video games. This is a perfect time to start figuring out how best to preserve and protect things that we need now more than ever. So, I hope by the end of this, you've all seen just what games are. They're not just a thing that we use to pass the time. They're a way of seeing, they're a way of knowing. They're a way that we escape. They're a way that we figure out who we are as individuals. They're a way to see cultures far beyond. They're a way for everyone to do better by themselves. No solution is gonna be perfect to how we preserve the gaming history. And each thing is gonna have a lot of issues down the road. By the end of the day, as long as we can preserve and protect, as long as we showcase the best that gaming has to offer, and as long as we're willing to showcase the knowledge and skills that we have in a field that's very diverse, we will have a lot to offer in the future. Your voice, the voice of the player, matters the most in protecting what we need to protect. With all that being said, would you like to save your game? Yes, yes. <laughs> Perfect. Thank you so much.